Good day, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our topic webinar, Processing a Protein Sex Data Set with Sex Lab. Mark Del Campo will be your host, and I, Joe Ferraro, will be your co-host. Mark, would you like to take it over? Thanks, Joe. Today, we're going to go over uh, data processing in Sachs Lab. So at the outset, I'd like to thank some of my Sachs colleagues. Dr. Tom Hendrickson is a senior software engineer and the author of the Sachs Lab software that I'll use today. And our Sachs product manager is Dr. Angela Criswell. This webinar is going to be recorded. A copy of the webinar and the data set are going to be made available to everyone in a few days. I welcome your questions. You can use the Q&A button to submit any questions and I'll address them at the end of the webinar. So the data that I'll show you today were collected on a Biosax 2000 on an FRX X-ray source. Our setup included a Rigaku Hypix 3000 hybrid photon county detector and an automatic sample changer. I collected data on human serum albumin or HSA from Sigma. The protein powder was reconstituted in a phosphate buffer, then a centrifuge, and then serially diluted to five, three, and one and a half mg per mil. So this is sort of a simple dilution series, single buffer, three concentrations. You may set up your own dilution series, do more concentrations, include more buffers, but for the purposes of this webinar, we're just going to go over these four samples. 70 microliters of each of them were loaded into the automatic sample changer and 60 minute SACS exposures were recorded and the detector output an image every 10 minutes for inspection. The data collection temperature was 20 degrees Celsius. The goal of my SACS measurement was to establish that I had an ideal and monodisperse HSA sample suitable for further analysis and modeling. The cartoon here attempts to illustrate the ideal and monodisperse sample on the left versus alternative situations like polydispersity on the top right versus non-ideal interactions such as repulsive interactions here and then attractive interactions or aggregation on the bottom right. The measurement we would like to make is using very dilute protein concentrations where any kinds of interactions would be minimized, but the SAC signal would be little to none. So we're left to use higher concentrations to get a nice measurable SAC signal and then perform this dilution series to be certain there are no concentration effects on the data. So let's move on to the data. So you're going to be able to follow along with each step that I do by looking at the notes here on the left hand side of the screen while I work in Sachs Lab on the right hand side of the screen. Our first order of business is to open Sachs Lab. So I'm going to locate and double click on the Sachs Lab processing icon, which is at the bottom of my screen. Double click, splash screen opens, Sachs Lab opens. So I'm just going to point your attention to the fact that we're using Sachs Lab version 4.0.2. This is the latest version of Sachs Lab. If you don't have it, I suggest that you update. The other thing I'm going to do here is click this blue arrow on the top right to just hide the tabbed contents on the right side, which includes the help menu, which is very useful. So I'm going to minimize that. And then we're working with a bigger area that we can see things on the screen. Okay, the next order of business is calibration. So we're gonna make sure that we click on the top left on the calibrate task, and then we're gonna click the open file button under image, and we're gonna to want to select our calibration image. So I'm using a silver behenate standard image here. I select it, I click on open, and the image opens in the software. In case you're interested, this is what silver behenate looks like on the left and its chemical formula. Silver behenate is a commonly used standard for calibrating sax instruments. You'll notice at the top of the screen uh, which calibration powder I'm using is important to be uh, selected. So I have the first radio button for silver behenate selected, and I will tell you this, this is from Kodak. So it's a highly 
well-made silver behanate compound that we got from Kodak. And a lot of our customers have a silver behanate that is from the company Alpha Azar. And it's not as pure as the Kodak stuff. So if you have the Alpha Azar stuff, you'd like to select this radio button when you do this calibration. If you know you're using the good Kodak stuff, have this radio button selected. So if you don't like the view of the contrast of these powder rings that you see on screen, you can adjust the contrast to view the rings clearly by clicking on the contrast tool and adjusting this slider and you can see the rings darken up for you. So we have the actual dark powder rings on the image and we're gonna use this button at the top right that says calibrate, we click on that and Saks Lab is gonna calibrate these red rings to the actual rings on the image and usually I click it once, twice, or three times, and all the parameters are going to refine. On the top left here are the sample to detector distance, the direct beam position in X and Y, and the edge of the shadow mask. So there's obviously a beam stop blocking the direct beam on the left-hand side of this image, and this last parameter indicates where it's drawing that mask. So this bit of four numbers is the calibration information. And so once you have these values, we can save out this stuff by clicking on the save file icon under calibration data. We click that and we save out these values to an XML file. So let's go over my two tips now. If you wanna check whether this calibration has run successfully, one thing you can do is click on this generate from image button on the right side and convert from a SAX image to a QFI image. And in this conversion, since all of these powder rings occur at the same resolution, all the rings end up as straight lines in this Q5 image, then you know the calibration has run correctly. My second tip is that once you've generated this XML file, if you're gonna process data that uses the same calibration in the future, instead of opening the image here, all you need to do is open up this XML file and you'll be good to run processing with Saks Lab. So the next order is to inspect the buffer images. So we're gonna click on the tab next to the calibrate task. This is the processing task. And then we wanna make sure underneath that that we're in 1D processing, which we are. And we wanna click on the green plus symbol that's underneath buffer curves here. That will open the file tree and we can select our buffer images. In the naming convention that I'm using and I recommend to our customers, it's easy to tell which uh, images are the buffers by the concentration field. So zero megs per mil indicates a buffer. So I'm gonna select the first image here and then go seven down, hit the shift key, left click again, select all seven of these images. Why are there seven images? Well, we're collecting a 60 minute exposure and we're outputting an image every 10 minutes. So the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth 10 minutes are these images one to six, and then the summed image of the total 60 minute exposure is this one on the top. So I click on open. All the images load in on the left. So the image names are here. There's a color code here, a key to show you which curve is which on the plots on the right. So on the right, you have one dimensional plots of a log of the intensity versus the resolution in Q or uh, inverse angstroms. And this log linear plot is sort of the standard way that Saks Lab is displaying this. If you prefer to see this in a log log, you can use the drop down menu here to select a log log plot if that's more comfortable for what you're used to viewing. I actually like the log linear myself, so I'll switch back. And immediately when you've loaded all these images in, you can see that they're all selected. So the first thing I like to do is go over to this little save selected button underneath where I loaded the images and click it. What that's gonna do is write out the one dimensional plots for each one of these images to a directory right away. So I have the dot dat files that I need if I wanna Look at these later in another processing program. The next thing I'm gonna do when I have the plots loaded is I'm gonna inspect these curves to see if I have any issues. It's all the same sample, it's this buffer. And so every one of these curves should overlay and be reproducible. 
things that you could see is that you've got an air bubble come into the capillary. And so what that's gonna look like is you're going to see the curves drop in intensity, full air will go very low. But if you see sort of drops in the intensity, you know you've got an air bubble or the samples moved completely out of the capillary. But otherwise, this stuff looks pretty reproducible. My tip number three is if you use a right click in the plotting window, draw out a box, you can zoom in and zoom in further. When you want to zoom out, click the middle mouse button and you can zoom back out. Okay, so next we're going to move on to inspecting a set of sample images. So now we're just going to move up in this same interface here and go under sample curves, click on the green plus symbol, we get the file tree, and now we get to select a sample set of curves to load in. And I'm going to just go down here and start with our highest concentration of five mix per mil, select all seven of those images, click open, and they all load into the interface. And it should immediately strike you that all of these curves overlay very nicely. So this looks pretty good. As I mentioned previously with the buffer, while they're all selected, click on the Save Selected button to write them out to the disk as .dat files. In addition to issues of seeing air with the sample, you're also interested in seeing whether you have radiation induced damage to the protein sample. So I don't have any in the HSA, but on the left side, I'm showing you a picture of what you would see. So this is a log log plot of the intensity versus Q. And you can see in this set of curves, starting with the black curve, which is the first interval of time, each subsequent image, the intensity is increasing. So this sort of systematic change of increasing intensity with subsequent exposures is a telltale sign that you are getting radiation-induced damage, radiation-induced aggregation, or structural changes due to x-ray. So that's something you want to take a look at. So averaging the 1D data. In the event that you do see sort of these changes, either an air bubble comes in at some point or you have some aggregation happening, usually that happens at some stage during the total exposure and you may wanna average some images. So for example, let's just say for this five mix per mil protein sample, images one, two, three, and four were fine. And then once we got image five, we started seeing signs of aggregation. So one approach would be to do some averaging of the images before this bad thing happened during your exposure. So to do that in SACS lab, what you wanna do is select the images you'd like to average. So you can use the control key with your left mouse click to select images one at a time, or you can select the first one and use the shift key to select all subsequent ones. And so if I was averaging the first four images, I'd have those selected and click average selected. So since they're all overlaying on the display here, I'll actually average all of them. I'll select all of them, click on average selected, and now I have an average curve in the list. The average curve right now only exists in the software because there's no image for the ad average curve. So as soon as I generate it, I wanna go underneath here and click on this save file icon to save out that average curve to the disk. And now it gets named. And you can see the suffix appended to the file name is AVG for average. Now in this list, we have both the summed image and we have the average. So if I select both of those and we take a look, you can see essentially they're the same data set. So if your individual images look fine, you're, you're welcome to just proceed with the summed image or if it doesn't look fine, then you have to generate this average and work with that. And the same procedure would apply for the buffer. So I select images one to six, and I click average selected. I have this average curve generated in software. I click this save file icon underneath. It's written out to disk, and now I have that as well. So that's the process for doing averaging within SACS Lab. 
So now let's move on to buffer subtraction. So what we want to do here is subtract out the capillary and buffer from the sample and just have the SACS data for this HSA at five mg per mil by itself. So what we have to do here is click enable sample subtraction. It's right here on the bottom left. It's a toggle switch. If I turn it on, I'm in sample subtraction mode. If I turn it off, I'm back to the mode I was in before. So I'll toggle it on. We're in buffer subtraction mode. And on the plotting window on the right, you can see that what's displayed is the sample curve in black, the buffer curve in blue, and the subtracted data in red. And the way that this plotting window works is whatever selected on the left-hand side is displayed in the right. So I'd like to select the summed image here for a five mg per mil HSA on the top and the summed image for the buffer on the bottom. And then those are the two data sets that are subtracted. And then I have my subtracted curve for the full 60 minutes or hour of data collection on that sample. Now to save out the subtracted curve, that's all the way on the bottom under the toggle switch to turn on subtraction mode. I click the save file icon and now that dot dat file is written to disk. Appended to that file name are the letters subtr for subtracted and that will also be on the disk. So this same procedure we're going to go through and do again when we do the other concentrations. There's a small bit of analysis that you can do while you're still in Saks Lab itself. Uh, one thing you can do is take a look at a Guignet plot. So next to 1D processing on this set of tabs here, we go two over to Guignet plot. We click on that and that brings us into a Guignet plot in Saks Lab. So I'll just remind you that a Guignet plot is the natural logarithm of the intensity versus Q squared. And this linear fit is done at the lowest region of Q in the data set. The equation for the line that's fit here is shown on the top left. You'll notice this form of Y equals MX plus B has the radius of gyration in the slope term. And for the Y intercept, this is I zero. So I zero is the total intensity at zero scattering angle which is going to be proportional to the number of electrons in the particle doing the scattering. So you can get a molecular weight from the I0, you can get a size parameter from the radius of gyration, and Saks Lab is generating both of these terms for you from this fit on the right-hand side of the screen. You can see the RG for this sample is 27.9 angstroms, the I0 is 29.9. The agreement for this fit, you can see this correlation term here, and you can see the residuals for the fit underneath the plot. See how good this is in terms of fitting a line. So when you inspect your guinea, one thing you want to look at is how much does this look like a line and do you have any curvature? So on the left hand side in these notes, you can see that things you don't want to see are frowning or smiling guineas. So a frowning guinea is a telltale sign that you've got inner particle repulsion and a smiling guinea is an indicator that you have aggregation happening in the sample. So that doesn't look like that's going on here. The other thing to note about the guinea plot is that the region chosen to determine the guinea is dependent upon the Q max times the RG has to be less than or equal to 1.3 for a globular protein. So Saks Lab is always reporting on, on the bottom here, right, that you have a Q max times RG equals 1.3 right now. And that's based on the Q max point that's used in this fit. And I can use the adjuster up here to change which points are used for this Q max. So if I go lower, you can see Q max times RG is less than 1.3. And if I increase, you can see Q max times RG grows until the point where I go above 1.3, I get a little warning that I'm outside the range. So that's all here for you. So you wanna make note of your RG and your I zero as you go through and take a look at each concentration. So another thing that you can look at with Saks Lab is a cracky plot. 
So if I click on 1D processing and bring us back to the plotting window, you'll notice underneath the plotting window, besides looking at a plot type of the intensity versus Q, I can also click on Kratky. So if I click on the radio button next to Kratky, it brings me into the Kratky plot. First thing we have to do here is deselect the sample and buffer curves, and now we see our Kratky plot. So Kratky plot is the uh, Q squared times the intensity on the Y axis versus Q on the X axis. These are both linear scales. And what you should see here for a sort of ideal compact folded protein is that you have a peak that almost returns to baseline. Uh, my illustration here for the examples is pulled from this publication here on the left. This is a Kratky plot for lysozyme under four sets of circumstances. So the black curve is folded. The uh, red curve is for a high concentration of urea. The blue curve is for partially folded because it's at high temperature. And the green one is where they're using both urea and high temperature. So the green one would be essentially unfolded lysozyme. As you unfold lysozyme, you're getting rid of the peak that you see in the Kratky plot. So this is just one indicator that we use to take a look at whether our sample looks nice and folded. And depending on the type of protein you're using or what you expect from your protein from the other things that you know about it, you may or may not expect to see such a nice peak. Okay, so the next series of steps is essentially repeating and tabulating what's going on. So if I wanted to now work with the next concentration in my list, which is three mg per mil, what I would do is turn off sample subtraction. I'd select all the curves here for the sample, hit the minus sign and clear that out. And now I hit the plus sign again and I would select from my file tree the next concentration, three mg per mil, click open, they open in, I inspect, I click on the save selected so all those curves get written to dat files. If I want to do averaging, I select the files I want to average, I can average them, I can save those out, how it's saved, and then again I can enter subtraction mode. The plotting window is still on the Kratky radio button so I can switch it back over to intensity versus Q. Now it looks better and I can select the sum and the sum from both the sample and the buffer lists. I have a nice subtracted data curve here. I can save it out by clicking on the save file icon. I can have a look at the guignet, come back to 1D processing. We could look at the cracky plot again, turn off sample, turn off buffer. So the same procedure you can go through for each concentration. And let's just do the last one real quick. I'm going to select all of these, take them out with the minus sign, go in, get our 1.5 mg per mil, load that in. They all load in, looks pretty good. Save them out, average them. Then we're going to save this average. And then I'm going to enter sample subtraction mode, summed image, summed image, looks good, save that out. And then we're going to go to the Guignet plot, looks pretty good. And of course I did all this beforehand and when I said tabulate, I would just make myself a quick Excel sheet with the concentrations of the protein that I'm measuring, the I zeros from the Guignet plot, the RGs from the Guignet plot, I have a little note here whether the sample looks like it's compact and folded from a cracky plot. And I'm having Excel calculate for me the I zero divided by the concentration. So if you see for the I zero divided by concentration and the RG columns that you have exactly the same information, the exactly same parameters determined, then you have a reproducible concentration series there are no concentration effects here. For example, I know from measuring HSA plenty of times that if I start getting into concentrations above seven, eight mgs per mil, 
what I'm going to see is a change in the RG and a change in the I0 divided by C when I start doing that. So concentration effects will start to come into play once I get above those concentrations. So once you're satisfied that you have a good concentration series and that you have parameters that agree, you can move on with your analysis, which is step four in this left-hand side notes. Now, if you're seeing concentration effects, then step three, you've got to change something and remeasure. You either repurify the sample, measure again, make more dilutions, change something about the buffer conditions. There's lots of, of steps involved in repreparing the sample and measuring it again. And even though we're only processing three samples here, this is by no means a limitation. You're free to measure as many dilutions as you see fit. So files, let's talk about files. If I go out to the directory tree here, you can see I have all of my images. And every time we press the save button, we generated a new directory that has dat files in it. So this curves directory inside has a single dot dat file for every image. The averaged directory has a dot AVG or an averaged data file for everything that we averaged. And the subtracted directory has our three subtracted dot dat files. So all of that stuff is right there on the disk. And you can take these files onward. In my tip number four, you can take it onward to your favorite SACS processing software. A lot of people are using ATSAS. So that's what you can do at this point. And that is where the standard set of processing capability of SACS Lab would normally end. So what I'm gonna do for you as a bonus here is just show you what the automatic processing pipeline can do if you have that add-on to the SACS Lab software. So the automatic processing pipeline or AAP uses programs from ATSAS to do a little bit more analysis on the sample. So this is not the full ATSAS suite. It's just a separate set of binaries that just do some initial analysis. The types of things that are done are listed here on the left, looking at the samples and aggregation identification, averaging buffer subtraction, looking at the guignets, crackies, molecular weight calculations, P of R functions, and some bead modeling. And you can also generate a PDF report. So if we're gonna run through the same set of samples using the AAP, what you'd wanna do is click on this AAP task on the top set of tabs and then click on the open file icon next to directory. You wanna make sure you're in your data directory folder and then click on select folder and everything loads in. And the first thing I like to do is make sure that the sample really loaded in sample and buffer really loaded in the buffer column, which is on the right. And I just scroll down in this list and I see all my samples are there. And on the right list, this is all buffer. So that looks great. The other thing that you wanna make note of is whether you're gonna be processing individual intervals of time. In this case, we have 10 minute intervals of time. And we also have the sum 60 minutes. I do not wanna average my individual time intervals with my full time interval. So what I'm gonna do quickly is just remove the 60 minutes from this set of automatic processing. So if I click on it in the list and I scroll down and find the next one, which is this one, and find the next one, which is that one. I'm just taking out the 60 minute data because what I want the pipeline to do is average the 10 minute sets. I'll do it for the buffer as well. Click the plus, the minus, and there it goes. So now I'm all set to get started. I wanna make sure also that my code and sample names are matching. If not, we've gotta turn on allow mismatch. Everything was collected in the same capillary because I was using automatic sample changer. Everything went through the same capillary. If you're using static capillaries with the biosacs, you have to make sure you have matching capillary IDs here for doing buffer subtraction. The other thing that you have to do is ensure that you have calibration information available to run this processing. You can see under calibration information, I have the XML file that I generated before when I calibrated. So that was automatically detected and loaded. If it's not, you just click on the open file icon and go around your directory tree and select that file and you'll be good to go. 
You may also want to configure the AAP to decide which jobs you'd like to run. So if I click on this configure button on the left, you see the menu for what the AAP can do. I have everything selected by default here just so we can run through a whole series. So the first thing that's gonna happen is it's gonna check for over subtraction and warn you if it's above a certain threshold and I have the threshold set at 5%. It's going to try to generate an infinite dilution set of data from the series. So that's this extrapolate to zero mg per mil. It's gonna calculate a Guignet plot with auto RG. You can change in the minimum number of points in that fit and the minimum quality that you'd like to see for a guignet for it to move on with the other steps in the pipeline. It's gonna calculate a molecular weight using a standard. What this means is you enter an I0 divided by C for a standard you've collected and a molecular weight for that standard. And it will calculate a molecular weight for your experimental sample based on that standard. The numbers I have entered in here are from this HSA standard, so I should get the exact weight for HSA, which is 66. It's going to calculate a P of R function using autogenome. It's gonna use a pour out volume to give you another molecular weight estimate. It's gonna use even another method, the volume of correlation to calculate another molecular weight. It's gonna use Shannon sampling to determine what the information content, how much Q range do you actually, should you use of this particular data set. And it's gonna use DAMF to do some bead modeling for you. And you can choose to select fast or slow annealing and the number of models. If you choose more than one model, then some averaging is gonna go on and the job will take longer because it does pairwise averaging. So I'll click okay there. And then what I'm gonna do is click on run pipeline and let the pipeline run. All right, so we'll continue here. So the, the AAP is finished running. The first thing we're looking at here is a summary. So before we focus on the summary, let's just go through the other tabs. We've got our subtracted data here displayed. Just note here in this display that the subtracted data are normalized by the input concentration. So if you are not careful and you haven't measured your sample concentrations well, this may, or made your dilutions well, this, the curves may not overlay here. Under the genome curves, we have our P of R functions, which all look pretty good. Kratky curves, we've got our Kratky plots. Guignet plot, it's empty, but you get to click on the left here and select which sample Guignet you would like to view. And then ab initio models, you have models here from DAMIF. For each concentration, you've got a model which you can rotate around. And it looks like two of the modeling jobs are still running. So this is running on two different processors that'll do two modeling jobs at the same time. And so it's modeling the five mg per mil and it's modeling one for this extrapolated to infinite dilution data set as well. So while the modeling is going on, you have these yellow beads that update. And when the modeling is finished, it turns to blue. In the summary tab, you can see we've got a summary for what went on. We've got our file names sample code, sample description, concentration, I0 divided by C, the Guignet range in points, the maximum Q from the data set as calculated by Shannon, a quality score for the Guignet, the actual RG from the Guignet, the P of R function quality, the RG from the P of R, the D max from the P of R, pour out volume, DAMIF volume, and then molecular weight estimates. So we've got the molecular weight estimate from the standard information, which we plugged into the configure panel, a molecular weight estimate from the pour out volume, a molecular weight estimate from the volume of correlation, and a molecular weight estimate from the modeling from the bead models. And so what you'd like to see here is that all four of these different molecular weight calculations all give you reasonable agreeing values. Second to last column is a shape classification. So it's telling me this looks like a compact sample. And then one thing that's probably sticking out is that one of these rows, the second one has a yellow highlight running through it and that's a warning. And so on the last column, it tells you why you're getting a warning. And so for this particular sample, it's warning me that I have over 5% 
over subtraction. It's not surprising given the Q range of the data set combined with the fact that this is the lowest concentration of HSA. So it still looks pretty good. So moving on, where are the files for the AAP? We go to our file tree. You can see now I have a process directory. Inside there, I have an AAP directory uh, where it has all the output files from the ATSAS jobs that ran. On the left here, I tell you that, that the genome output is in the genome folder, uh, models are in the models folder, dot dat files from the averaging, subtraction, and normalization are in the subtracted folder, the dot dat file for the extrapolation is in the zero cons folder. If we go back up one, you can see we've got all the dat files created by Sax Lab in this parent folder, plus the results table that we're seeing in Sax Lab is also generated here in HTML and XML format. And with that, I'd just like to say thank you for attending the webinar today.